seat. What are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat. What have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat. The corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb. Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things anti-nuclear. My name is Libby Halevi. I'm the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when the so-called nuclear experts get it wrong. This week we hear an interview with Alex Rosen. A German pediatrician and board member of the International Physicians for Prevention of Nuclear War, or IPPNW, Alex takes on the recent report of the United Nations Science Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation, or UNSCEAR, that seriously downplayed the health dangers of Fukushima's radiation releases. For those of you who follow Nuclear Hot Seat. I want you to know that this interview ranks right up there with my interview with Allison Katz of Independent WHO for its power and clarity. That extended interview plus numbnuts of the week, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission doc and cover report, and all the rest will be coming up in just a few minutes. Today is Tuesday, July twenty second, twenty fourteen, and here is the week's anti nuclear news. Over the weekend. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, baby, made a statement over the weekend that he would restart Japan's nuclear reactors, quote, by some means or another, end quote. He hinted that he would ignore the rule of law or the will of the people yet again. He made this statement at a meeting with business executives in Fukuoka. So the question is, was he just being a poseur with business, or is this a foreshadow of a political power grab? Stay tuned. Reactors one and two at the Sendai plant in Kagoshima Prefecture this past Wednesday became the first to be declared to meet strict new safety standards imposed after the Fukushima disaster began on March 11 of 2011. The seal of approval was included in a report released by Japan's Nuclear Regulation Authority, but the watchdog's approval will come. Listen to that wording. Will come after a month of public comment on the report. Done deal. Let's hope not. It is still unclear when exactly the utility will return to service, if ever. Among the considerations are that the Sendai plant is located in an area surrounded by volcanoes. Even Kyushu Electric, which runs the facility, says there are 39 volcanoes within 160 kilometers, or just under 100 miles, of the plant. As we reported on last week's nuclear hot seat. Reactor five at Fukushima Daiichi, which we don't hear about very often, lost its cooling system, and the reactor temperature jumped 13 degrees Celsius or 55 degrees Fahrenheit in just two days. When they got the coolant system back down to normal, the reactor temperature jumped up almost the same amount, 13.5 degrees Celsius over 55 degrees Fahrenheit. That means reactor five is still aggressively heated. Even though Tepco has declared it in cold shutdown, now Tepco has only one coolant system for Reactor Five, which means they have to go back and forth between whether they're cooling the reactor or the spent fuel pool. It's a real seesaw, teeter totter of suspense at Fukushima Daiichi yet again. According to measurements taken but not announced by Tepco. Groundwater on the sea side of Unit Two at Fukushima Daiichi measured one billion two hundred million becquerels of radionuclides per cubic meter, and that included strontium ninety and cesium one thirty four. These are the highest readings since measuring began. No wonder why Tepco did not want to announce it publicly. Again, thanks to Fukushima Diary for this information. Nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat. Num num sound a week. The Fukushima city government announced a public information program to educate about radiation. 
About the dangers? No! It's entitled, Let's Build a Body Constitution That Can't Be Defeated by Radiation. Ra, ra, ra. It's supposed to teach kids how to get over radioactive contamination. Hey, it's no more than the flu, so sneeze it out. They put out posters that read, How to Get the Lifestyle to Increase Metabolism. They say an efficient metabolism helps push out radioactive material even if we take it in. So go to bed early, kids, and get up early so you can have a good sleep. Have breakfast. Eat a well-balanced diet. Take good exercise. And then make sure to point out it is important to take a walk or play outside. This is in Fukushima, remember. They say also, don't worry excessively. Try not to get stressed too much. Right. Your home is a radiation zone. Don't worry. Be happy. With my apologies to Bobby McFerrin. The poster goes on to say, keep these in mind. And this is where the insanity truly gets thick. It says, open the window to keep good ventilation. Dry clothes in sunshine meaning out of doors where the radionuclides can land on them as hot particles. Air your futon outside when it's sunny. Same as the previous point. And then, just wash your hands and gargle when you get back inside. So kids, pay absolutely no attention to this disinformation campaign, because it is truly none that's out of the week. We're going to post some pictures on the website this week from Nuclear Hot Seat number 135, which show nuclear refugee Setsuko Kida in her home in Fukushima and what she has to go through just to be able to do the dishes. Over to the U.S. now for a numbnuts adjacent story. And that's at our favorite U.S. nuclear accident site that is still ongoing, the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIP, site in Carlsbad, New Mexico. It was recently learned that just five days after an underground truck fire closed the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, the Energy Department awarded the contractor that operates the nuclear repository $1.9 million for excellent performance during the past year. Four days after that, An explosion in a stored container released radiation that was released into the atmosphere and closed down the site for the foreseeable future. Excellent performance there. So one radiation leak and two sharply worded accident investigation reports after that award, that same contractor was slammed for long-running safety and maintenance problems, but the award still stands. According to an editorial in Weapons Complex Monitor, no federal or contractor official has lost their job, been transferred, been moved off the WIP contract, or otherwise held accountable. No leadership has been changed at the federal level. No company has lost a contract. Wouldn't we all like to have job security like that? This story, by the way, came from Lauren Villagran, who is a staff writer with the Albuquerque Journal, Las Cruces Bureau. Time to catch up to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission duck (laughs) and cover report. An apparent violation in procedures at the Akani Nuclear Station in South Carolina allowed an undetected crack to leak and forced a shutdown. So the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has set up a conference to discuss the problem. When did the leak happen? November of 2013, and they're just getting around to the conference now. The NRC and owner-operators of Akani, Duke Energy, said they will discuss the safety significance of the apparent violation related to an undetected crack in a well that led to reactor coolant system pressure boundary leakage. In other words, there was a leak in the system that is required to cool the reactor core in case of an accident. Duck and cover in Florida. Rising water temperatures have threatened to force the shutdown of two nuclear reactors at Florida Power and Light's Turkey Point plant. The canal temperatures, climbing up to 99 degrees, have come within one degree of a federal limit that would mandate a shutdown. But Florida Power and Light has two fixes in mind to take 
control of the problem. The first, cool the canals with daily injections of millions of gallons from an underground reservoir that supplies Miami-Dade County's drinking water. What could go wrong? Then, FPL also has asked the NRC to raise the 100-degree operating limit to 104 degrees in order to keep those reactors online. That's right. Don't change the science. Change the perception of the science. Duck into cover. And New York State environmental regulators are proposing a shutdown of the Indian Point nuclear power plant to protect fish in the Hudson River during summer months. Indian Point withdraws up to two and a half billion gallons of water per day from the Hudson to cool equipment and then discharges hotter water back into the river. Environmental groups and the New York Department of Environmental Conservation have long argued that Indian Point's water intake system kills about a billion fish, fish eggs, and larvae each year, and the plant should install cooling towers to reduce the use of river water by recycling it. But Energy says that cooling towers are too expensive, dude. They're going to cost up to $2 billion. So screw the fish and pass the sushi. And while you're at it, NRC, Energy wants you, yes, you, to renew their operating licenses at the two ancient Indian Point reactors for another 20 years each. Energy continues to operate the two Indian Point reactors, despite the fact that Unit 2's license expired in 2013, and Unit 3's will expire in 2015. But hey, if we can all drive without a valid license, so can they! So suck it up, duck, (laughs) and cover. A reminder to you all that my nuclear memoir, Yes, I Glow in the Dark, One Mile from Three Mile Island to Fukushima and Beyond, has been published as an ebook on Amazon Kindle. You can purchase it on Amazon and know that when you do, you're supporting my work here on Nuclear Hot Seat and, oh yeah, you're getting a great read as well. Now for this week's interview. In April, when the United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation, or UNSCIR, published a report that seriously, if not criminally, understated the health dangers of the Fukushima nuclear disaster, I knew the interview I wanted to get. It just took me a little while to get it, but it's got, and here it is. Alex Rosen is a German pediatrician who is vice president of the International Physicians for Prevention of Nuclear War in Germany. He's also a former vice chair of the International IPPNW Board of Directors. He uses that organization's recently published critical analysis of the UNSCIR report to decode its methodology and, in effect, demolish its credibility. Alex Rosen, welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat. Hello. Greetings from Berlin. What is the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, or IPPNW, and what is your position in regard to it? IPPNW is an international NGO founded in 1980 by a Soviet and an American cardiologist who had the crazy notion to not just save their patients, but the whole world by making everyone understand the true dangers behind nuclear weapons. They managed to get the leaders of their two countries down to negotiate arms reduction and uh, received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1985. IPPNW has been around since the 1980s and has expanded its mission not just to work against nuclear weapons, but also against all parts of the nuclear chain. That is, the uranium mining, the civil use of nuclear energy, the military use um, of nuclear weapons, all the way to the problem of nuclear waste. My position in IPPNW is that I am currently the vice chair of the German affiliate. We have more than 60 affiliates around the world, and the German one, which has its head office here in Berlin, has about 7,000 members, and we have a board that I am a member of. What is the IPPNW's previous relationship or stance as regards UNSCIR? UNSCIR, the United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation, has been widely criticized, not just by IPPNW, but by doctors and scientists around the world for its stance on uh, nuclear energy, especially regarding the um, accident or the catastrophe in, in Chernobyl. And this is a history or the story that we see repeating itself now again in Fukushima, 
that Unscare is issuing statements and, and press releases that we feel are not very representative of what is really going on on the ground. So IPPNW Germany has been criticizing Unscare ever since Chernobyl for its stance on promoting uh, or whitewashing nuclear catastrophes. And right now we are working together with more than a dozen other IPPNW affiliates around the world, including the U.S. affiliate, on actually making known and making making public what Unscare is, is saying and uh, where their report about the Fukushima disaster is wrong. IPPNW has issued a critique, an annotated critique, of the UNSCIR report on Fukushima. Before we get into the specifics of it, how was this put together? Well, we are an international organization, so we have people all over the world working on this topic. And mainly the U.S. and the German affiliate have been uh, working on, on this topic of the UNSCARE report, meeting regularly on Skype calls, um, sending each other documents, exchanging views, and getting expertise from all over the world, from India, from the U.K., from Australia, from Austria and Switzerland, from some of our African affiliates like in Nigeria, Scientists and doctors all across the world bringing together their expertise on the health effects of ionizing radiation in order to really take a critical look at UNSCARE's findings and make public what we feel is, is wrong or is missing. There are 10 specific conclusions that were reached by this critical analysis as regards the UNSCAR report. Let's go through them individually so you can explain to us the exact factors that led to the conclusions and the criticisms that you have about the report. The first is that the validity of UNSCIR's source term estimates is in doubt. Yes. Um, when we looked at UNSCIR's report, the most obvious question that we had, first of all, is which facts do they base their calculations of the health effects in Fukushima on? And one of the most important parameters when you look at um, radioactive contamination is, of course, how many radionuclides, how much radioactivity was released by the accident. And there are several calculations or estimations that are circulating internationally by different organizations, and they give different numbers on the size or the magnitude of radioactive emissions. And what UNSCARE does is it doesn't take the most neutral source. It doesn't take a median between the highest and the lowest estimation. It doesn't take a source that you could argue this would be the most uh, most believable. They take the Japanese Atomic Energy Association scientist whose estimation on the amount of, of radioactive emissions is lower by a few factors than the estimations by neutral sources like the Norwegian Institute for Air Research or the Austrian Central Meteorologic Institute. So just to give one example, UNSCAR says that the emission of cesium-137, so that's a very particular radionuclide that's important to know when you talk about radioactive contamination, was 9 peta becquerel. So that's nine quadrillion becquerel, uh, whereas the independent Norwegian Institute for Air Research, they found 37 peta becquerels, more than four times that number. And now we're not saying that the Norwegians are completely right and the Japanese Atomic Energy Association is completely wrong. All we're saying is if there's different numbers, you have to closely look at who is publishing these numbers, with which interest, how valid are their calculations, and does it really make sense to take the lowest possible numbers which come from the Japanese Atomic Energy Association directly, an organization that is being heavily criticized by the Japanese parliament, in fact, for being co-responsible for the nuclear disaster in Fukushima. And if you take their numbers, their low estimates, then obviously your calculations that you do with these numbers will have a systematic underestimation of the health effects in the end. There are serious concerns regarding the calculations of internal radiation. Yes, that's the next issue that we are dealing with in our report or our critique of the UNSCARE report, the concerns regarding the calculations of internal radiation. So the next parameter after looking at the emissions, the magnitude of the emissions, is you want to see how much of this radioactivity was actually incorporated by people. And it, with incorporated, I mean inhaled in terms of radioactive dust floating in the atmosphere or ingested with food or drink. So it's very important to look at the radioactive contamination 
of food and drink in, in Japan, especially in the affected uh, region in northeastern Honshu Island, and to look at how much of this radioactivity would actually be ingested by people or inhaled. And in order to do that, you need to have food samples, first of all. You need to go on the fields and in the markets and actually take samples in order to calculate or estimate how much radioactivity is in everyone's food. And you need to make assumptions on the amount of food people eat, the origin of their food. And what UNSCARE does is, first of all, they base their entire calculations on internal radiation on one single source. And now this source could be an independent scientific uh, committee or an organization that has done independent testing. But instead, what UNSCARE does is they take as the single source of their calculation of internal radiation the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA. And we all know that the IAEA was founded in order to promote civil nuclear energy. So they don't have a very big interest in actually showing a lot of negative effects of the Fukushima nuclear disaster. In fact, you could say they're very biased and they're not the best source to base calculations of internal radiation on. But this is what UNSCAR does. They take the IAEA food database as the single source of their calculations, and um, nowhere in the document, in the UNSCAR report, does it say how these samples were taken, who took them, where they were taken, when they were taken. It just refers to a spreadsheet, the food database, which never appears in the document and which is supposed to be published at a later point in a sort of addendum, but which still isn't available to researchers and independent uh, scientists like us wanting to see where this data actually comes from. So there's no way to check or to control how valid these food samples were. What we do know is that the IAEA database, of which certain parts have been published by the WHO, shows maximum levels of, of radioactive contamination, which are much lower than even the Japanese government's numbers. So we're very worried that by taking this database as a single source, you're actually underestimating the effects of internal radiation and adding to that the assumptions that UNSCARE bases its calculations on, assumptions on the amount of food that people eat from the affected region, the amount of checks and, uh, and controls that are taking place in Fukushima, these assumptions are just are just wrong. They're not based on reality, and they draw a picture that is much too optimistic in our view. Another issue that was raised by the critique of Unskir's report is that the dose assessments of the Fukushima workers cannot be relied upon. Yes, this is uh, another point where, again, we're talking about uh, which sources you base your calculations on. If you're looking at the group of Fukushima workers, um, you would think that you would take independent uh, research data on these people in order to calculate their health effects. But instead, UNSCARE bases its numbers solely on the numbers that it gets from TEPCO. Now, TEPCO is the company that ran Fukushima before it went bankrupt over the catastrophe. It's a company that owns several nuclear power plants in Japan that made millions, if not billions of dollars with nuclear energy, and which obviously does not have an interest in making this catastrophe look worse than it is. And um, instead, what we see is that they don't just hire people themselves, but what they do oftentimes is they hire subcontractors. And these subcontractors hire other subcontractors. So in the end, the people actually doing the dirty work in and for TEPCO are people that are so far away from TEPCO's rules and regulations that it's very difficult to actually make sure that these people adhere to the safety standards, that these people's exposition to radioactive contamination is actually properly measured. There have been reports of missing dosimeters. There have been reports of uh, lead coverings on the dosimeters in order to manipulate the readings. There have been reports of mafia connections in the group of subcontractors. So there's a lot of shady deals and corruption going on on these levels. And taking the numbers of TEPCO as the sole source to calculate health effects of the workers without any independent data available, nothing from the government, nothing from independent researchers, just TEPCO's own data, again leads to systematic underestimation of the health effects. 
Excuse me, I just have to pause for a moment because the it, it's one thing to say, you know, they're, that they're wrong about it. It's another to hear the specifics of exactly how they manipulated it. Another conclusion that was reached by the report is that the UNSCARE report ignores the effects of fallout on the non-human biota. Yes, what that means is that we're not just talking about humans, obviously, we're talking about plants, we're talking about animals. And what we've learned from Chernobyl is that, especially in the animal population, you are much better able to demonstrate health effects and transgenerational effects, not just on the animals that were alive and present at the time of the disaster, but their offspring generations down the line. And obviously with butterflies or mice, you have much better chances at researching these transgenerational effects than, than you do in a, in a human population where obviously people are not guinea pigs. So um, what scientists have been doing, and uh, there's a very active U.S. group around Tim Mosso, who's a, a scientist who's been traveling to Chernobyl for many years, catching birds and looking at, at different types of animals and their health effects in regards to, to radioactive contamination. And they've been able to find several very meaningful health effects concerning fertility, concerning mutations, and all of this knowledge is out there. It's, it's published in peer-reviewed journals. It's there, and you can research it on the Internet but it doesn't appear in the Unscare report. What the Unscare report says is that there's no real data on the non-human biota, and therefore they did not take it into consideration. And this is something that we are criticizing, obviously, because you can't say because something happens to butterfly, it will also happen to humans. But at least, and this is what we know from pharmacological studies and other, other health studies, you can deduce something from it. And you can say, well, if this happens in all types of mammals, why shouldn't it happen in human beings? And especially the transgenerational effects, which are so difficult to demonstrate in in a human population, can be demonstrated, can be seen, can be proven in animal populations. And that's at least food for thought. It's at least something that should be considered. And you, you should say, well, we see this effect in animals. We see this effect in plants. We expect a similar effect in human beings. How large it is, we don't know at this point, but at least it's ground enough for further research. But this is not happening, and this is our our criticism. And what we're doing in, in our paper is basically listing some of the findings of Tim Oso and his group and asking Unscare to include it in, in, in future future publications. The next issue that was raised by the critique was the special vulnerability of the embryo to radiation and that it was not taken into account. Yeah, this is an issue that's very important to me as a pediatrician. Human beings don't react to radioactivity the same way. Radioactivity has stochastic effects. That means that it's not about determining a certain dose or a certain amount of radioactivity that is harmful and everything below that is is safe. It's not like that. It's actually similar to when you're talking about smoking. You can't say two cigarettes is fine and three cigarettes will kill you. It's all about chances that you take. And the more you smoke or the more contact you have to radioactive exposure, the higher your chances of actually getting a disease or getting cancer. And obviously this is, like in smoking, very dependent on your own genetic background, on your own immune system. So obviously someone who has a very good immune system, who is rather good at repairing cell defects from radiation or other toxins, will have a lower chance of actually catching cancer, for example, after being exposed to radiation. So there's people out there, for example, people with immune defects, people who take medication that reduces their immune functions, and children whose immune systems aren't fully developed yet, who have a much higher vulnerability towards radioactive effects. And this is not taken into consideration, especially the unborn child, which is the most vulnerable to radioactivity. We know that from research that goes back into the 1950s, an adult can very well take an x-ray of the chest without developing cancer afterwards. But we know that an unborn child in a, in a woman's womb is so vulnerable to radioactivity or to ionizing radiation that in fact even small amounts of radiation, like from a normal x-ray, can actually increase the chances of a child getting cancer by very substantial degrees. So one single x-ray to the abdomen of a pregnant woman would increase the chance of getting cancer within childhood by 50%. 
And this is just one x-ray, and we're talking about much higher doses in Fukushima. So by saying that all people are alike, and all children are alike, and there's no difference between an unborn child or a child of five years old, this radiobiologic knowledge that we've accumulated over several decades is just completely discounted in the UNSCA report, and they're acting like we wouldn't know that children, and especially unborn children, have a much higher vulnerability. So that's a point that, that I, especially as a pediatrician, feel very strongly about that needs to be corrected. It, it cannot be that we base all our recommendations regarding radiation dose levels on healthy adults, healthy male adults, instead of actually on the most vulnerable population, which is the unborn child. Here's one of the other points that really struck me in the list of objections that have been voiced by IPPNW against the UNSCE report, and that is non-cancer diseases and hereditary effects were ignored by UNSCE. Yes, that's another big problem. Even though we know for many years that radiation, ionizing radiation, causes not just cancer effects, but non-cancer effects as well, such as cardiovascular diseases, glaucoma, psychological and neurological effects, endocrinologic diseases, diseases of the thyroid, for example. We know all of this also from the victims of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but also from um, the liquidators of Chernobyl, uh, the people that were sent in to, to clean up the mess after, after the explosion. And this knowledge is completely ignored by UNSCARE. They act as if there was no scientific evidence for it, even though there's numerous studies that show the significant effects of radiation on, for example, cardiovascular diseases or thyroid diseases in people who received low-dose radiation after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the same is true for transgenerational effects, genetic effects in future generations that we also see, for example, in, in the studies done on animals by Tim Mousseau that I mentioned earlier, but also on, on human populations where the effects, for example, on children of British nuclear workers lead to increased leukemia rates if their parents were exposed to, to radioactivity. So these are effects that you can't just argue away. Instead of arguing away, they're just being ignored by UNSCARE. UNSCARE also did, according to the analysis, misleading comparisons of nuclear fallout with background radiation. So this is what UNSCARE and other organizations are frequently doing. They're saying, hey, we're just talking about an additional radiation dose of one or two millisieverts per year per person. So this can't really be harmful because natural background radiation is already one or two millisieverts a year. And that's where they're wrong. Obviously, natural background radiation is something that you can't completely avoid. And there's regions in the world where it's higher and there's regions in the world where it's lower. But studies have repeatedly shown that in the regions where it's higher, it's actually causing more cancer. And in the regions where it's lower, people have less cancer. And people who are exposed to more radon gas in, in their homes because they live in an environment that is very rich in radioactive substances in the ground have higher cancer rates. And people who fly a lot, transatlantic flights, and have increased cosmic radiation, they get more cancers. And people who are exposed to higher degrees of terrestrial radiation, they also have a higher uh, cancer rate because the correlation between cancer and or the chance of, of getting cancer and radiation dose is linear, linear without a threshold. So it goes down to zero. Even small radiation doses lead to a, a measurable rise in the chance to develop cancer. And there is no threshold under which you can say everything is safe. And this is the, the story that they're trying to, to sell to people, if it's just one or two millisieverts per year that you're exposed to because of Fukushima fallout, then you don't have anything to worry about. But that's not true. That's like saying to someone, listen, you're just smoking one cigarette a day. That's something that everyone smokes, so you shouldn't worry about it. But people who want to live healthy lives, people who don't want to be exposed to radiation, people who don't want an increased cancer rate, they should have the right to live in an environment that is healthy and that is free of radioactive contamination from, from nuclear fallout. This is something that's man-made. It, it's preventable. And in the regions where it's not preventable anymore because fallout happened, you should give options to the people to move to other places. But this is not happening. 
This next conclusion, number eight, is, I think, masterful understatement. And that is that the IPPNW says that Unskier's interpretations of the findings are questionable. Yes, what we mean by that is it's not just that they base their calculations on the data and the assumptions, and it's not just the way that they calculate it, but in the end, they draw conclusions. And these conclusions, you could say, okay, now we can calculate how many deaths or how many cancer cases are to be expected. But Ansgar doesn't do that. They don't seriously discuss their findings. So, I mean, we're walking a tight line here. On the one hand, we're criticizing Unscare for systematically underestimating the health effects. On the other hand, we are asking them to at least use the findings that they have and interpret them in a way for people to understand them. It's not very useful to tell people this is the collective dose that the population will be exposed to because people can't really do anything with that number. But if you take this number and you you actually use the risk factors that, that are publicly available and you calculate what health effects, what number of cancer cases or cancer deaths this leads to, then you can tell people what they actually can expect. And at the same time, we have to say that these expectations or these, these estimations are probably still an underestimation due to the, the factors that we mentioned earlier. Another criticism brought forward is that the protective measures taken by the authorities are misrepresented. As Unscare mentions in its report that radiation exposure to the population would have been much higher if the government hadn't protected the population so well. And while this is obviously true, population could have been exposed to more radiation in, in Japan, we feel that it's wrong to cheer the Japanese government for its wonderful uh, cleanup efforts or its wonderful preventive efforts because actually what happened in Fukushima, and this is not our opinion, this was, was written by the Japanese Parliament's investigation committee, was a complete breakdown of the measures that should actually have protected the population. There was complete and utter chaos. People did not know what they were doing. There were no plans in the drawer. The prime minister was completely taken by surprise. He didn't know that Japan had, for example, a radiation tracking system in place that could have let people know where radiation was actually traveling to. Instead, people were evacuated from areas of low radiation to areas of high radiation because no one in the upper echelons knew that this the system existed. We all know that stable iodine tablets can prevent radioactive iodine from a nuclear catastrophe from traveling to the thyroid and causing thyroid cancer. But in Japan, these stable iodine tablets were not distributed to the population in order to prevent a mass panic. So there were a lot of issues concerning the immediate uh, response to the catastrophe concerning the evacuations, the extent of the evacuations, the cleanup efforts, where it's not very useful to actually say that uh, everything went perfectly and otherwise the catastrophe would, would have been much bigger. We feel that it's just fitting at this point to join the Japanese Parliament's investigation commission in their criticism of, of how badly actually the first response was and what could have been done better. Because, I mean, we're dealing with a problem that could happen any day again in Japan with more than 50 nuclear sites and an earthquake-prone region. So this is not something that happened once and will never happen again. We know from Chernobyl, we know from Fukushima, from Harrisburg, that it could happen any time and in every country. So in order to improve the safety plans and the public safety for the population, it's not very useful to just say this time everything went well because it didn't. And obviously, it could have been much worse, yes. Japan was very lucky, so to speak. The people of Japan were very lucky that the wind was blowing eastwards and blew more than 80% of the radiation out to the sea. If the wind had blown south, even just for one day, the metropolis of Tokyo would have been subjected to radioactive fallout. And this is something that we don't want to imagine what that would have caused. But in effect, there was just one day of wind going northwest, which now is causing most of the problems that we're seeing in the, in the heavily affected um, cities and communities, just from one day of radioactive fallout, all the other days, the Japanese were lucky enough that the wind blew east. So, yes, it's some way you can say that um, this catastrophe could have been much, much worse. The last point made is that conclusions from collective dose estimates were not represented. 
Yeah. Um, like I said before, the UNSCA report mentioned the collective dose estimates, so it said how many person sieverts uh, the Japanese population will be exposed to in the coming decades, but they failed to actually say what this would mean for the people. To give an example, we tried to add this estimation. Just to give an example of how we did that, Unscare says that there will be a total collective dose of 48,000 person sieverts. So the total collective dose is the sum of all the individual doses of every person in Japan that is exposed to radioactivity due to Fukushima over their lifetime. This is the total collective dose, so 48,000 person sieverts. And if you take the risk factors that are internationally accepted, then this would lead to between four and 16,000 excess cases of cancer in Japan. Again, based on the underestimations that I just explained. So the number would probably be much higher if you actually took the right data and the right assumptions. But this is, if you just take the numbers that UNSCA represents and calculates, you are dealing with four to 16,000 additional cases of cancer and two to 9,000 of these fatal. So you have 16,000 people who would develop cancer due to Fukushima who would otherwise not have developed cancer you have a lot of them who survive after chemotherapy operations or radiation therapy, but you have 9,000 or a little bit more than 9,000 people who will die because of cancers related to the Fukushima nuclear accident. And this is something you have to tell the people. This is something that you have to admit and say, listen, this was a huge catastrophe and this is what this will lead to. And what we can do is try to reduce this number by really having strict controls of radioactive contamination in the food, moving people, especially young families and children, away from the radioactively contaminated regions, giving them all the support that we can in order to get them out of the contaminated areas and to give them health care and health checks as would be appropriate in order to localize cancers and other diseases early and in order to treat them better. But only very little is happening in this regard. People are actually encouraged to move back to the radioactively contaminated regions because of economic factors. They don't want uh, these regions to become empty. They want to forget this ever happened. They want people to move on. And they don't want to admit that this will have health effects in the coming decades. They don't want to uh, admit that people will be suffering from it. And with they, I mean the Japanese nuclear village, the politicians behind nuclear energy, the companies behind nuclear energy, the state control organizations which are receiving money from the nuclear industry, all of them are trying to whitewash this, this catastrophe. And UNSCARE is part of this movement. UNSCARE is, is helping them. And this is something that we cannot accept as, as scientists and as doctors, that a UN body is actually whitewashing this catastrophe. This is a damning analysis of UNSCARE and their report. In your estimation, is UNSCARE operating out of a difference of opinion an alternative interpretation of the data that they are using, or is there an element of outright lying and propaganda on the part of UNSCIR to protect the nuclear industry? I think that's a very difficult issue to tackle. You have to see that UNSCIR is a UN body, and as a UN body, the states that are members of the UN are sending delegates or are sending representatives to this body. So the question is, which states are sending representatives? It's the nuclear states. It's the United States, it's Canada, it's Germany, it's Japan, it's uh, India. It's the countries that have nuclear power, that have the capacity to have nuclear programs. And obviously these countries have a vested interest in keeping this nuclear power, this nuclear capacity. So they're sending scientists which are coming straight out of their nuclear programs, scientists that have grown up in these nuclear programs, that have made a career in the International Atomic Energy Agency, that have been working for nuclear fuel companies. So these are not people that you would say are critical of nuclear energy. No scientist that has ever published a critical paper on nuclear energy or health effects of ionizing radiation will ever be allowed in UNSCARE. UNSCARE is a club of scientists representing the interests of the nuclear states. And this is something that people have to be aware of. It's not an independent body. 
of research. It's not a body that is composed of critical scientists on the one hand and pro-nuclear scientists on the other hand. It's strictly pro-nuclear and there's people sitting sitting on UNSCARE and there's the scientists that are being quoted in their paper who have been working their entire lives for the nuclear industry in their countries. So I wouldn't go so far to say that they are lying, they are doing propaganda, but they have a group think. They're coming from organizations that are very pro-nuclear. They've never heard anything different. They have a certain bias that they just can't get away from. And what's necessary in science, in true science, is that you have different opinions and scientists from different fields arguing with each other and actually testing their hypothesis and testing their opinions against each other so that in the end what comes out is as close to the truth as possible. But UNSCARE is not the right body to do that. UNSCARE does not allow criticism, does not allow a neutral position. And so while I wouldn't say that UNSCARE deliberately lies or uses propaganda, I have to say that its views and its papers show very clearly who's paying the bill and very clearly where these people are coming from. How has the IPPNW critical analysis been received, meaning by the media? Has there been any kind of governmental response to it? And has it been acknowledged and responded to by UNSCARE? That's a very interesting question. We were in contact with UNSCARE before publishing our paper, and we actually UNSCARE published a sort of executive summary, a sort of teaser or a a preview on their full report at the UN uh, General Assembly last October. And when we read this preview, we immediately responded to UNSCARE and told them, well, listen, reading through your your paper, your executive summary, these are the points, these are the issues that we have problems with, these are the points that we see critically, and do you want to have a dialogue with us? What they did was they actually took a lot of our arguments and we find now in the final paper, in the final version, some of our wording, some of our arguments, but the conclusions, they stay the same. So in our (laughs) first uh, first letter to UNSCARE, we criticized them for sitting in their ivory tower and passing judgment on people far away in other countries without actually looking at their individual suffering and their individual situations and just saying, don't worry, everything will be fine. But they don't travel to Fukushima and talk to the people up there and, and ask them how they are feeling. So in their final paper, what they say is the same conclusion, everything will be fine, but they add the sentence that obviously it's very important to uh, realize that people are suffering and to uh, pay close attention to the individual stories of the people on the ground. So we see that in a way they've responded and taken up some of our criticism, but nothing has changed regarding their conclusions. And this is something that we don't expect in any case. I mean, we don't expect to make a big dent on this organization of UNSCARE because obviously they come from backgrounds that don't allow for critical thinking or for critical points regarding nuclear energy. <laughs> That's not how they make their money. That's not why they are sitting in this in this position and being flown across the world in this UN body. It's because they are saying what the governments want them to say. Regarding the reception that our paper got by the media, there were two large press conferences, one in New York City in front of the UN together with the Human Rights Now and one in Berlin. Both were pretty well um, visited. We had some TV appearances, we had some newspaper articles and radio articles or radio stories regarding our findings. Overall, it's a very scientific and very specific topic and doesn't really go down well in, in mainstream media. But that wasn't our intention. I think our intention was that this UNSCA report will be cited and will be referred to for years to come. People always say, well, in the UNSCA reports, it says this and that. And our point was just that we want to give people an alternative view. We want to say, well, it might say so in the UNSCA report, but read our criticism and then question if what it says in the UNSCA report is really the truth. We don't think that we have the truth in our hands either. We are much too small and much too limited in our resources to be able to do giant research on hundreds and thousands of people in Japan in order to find out what's what's actually happening with them. But what we can do as scientists and as, as doctors and as human beings is to ask critical questions and to ask, is this really believable? Is this really the truth? And I think the journalists that caught this line, who saw that as we are just doctors, 
trying to protect our patients, trying to stand up to a industrial lobby, which is causing harm to public health, promoting a world that is healthy and free of nuclear contamination. I think these journalists, they got it right and they were able to spread our message. And we hope that in the coming years and decades, when people look at the UNSCARE report, they will also find our report and have maybe a more critical or unbiased view of UNSCARE's findings. What can we do to help bring this important analysis to international attention? Well, what we're trying to do now is to actually get this criticism to the different UN delegations, which will be reviewing UNSCARE's report at the upcoming General Assembly meeting in October. What every individual blogger, journalist, everyone who's in the topic can do is actually spread this uh, this information and say, well, here's the UNSCARE report, you can read it and you can find a lot of information in it. And here's a critical analysis of the UNSCARE report, which you can use in addition in order to better understand where the limitations and problems of the UNSCARE report actually lie. If someone is able to make this information more widely known, for example, through news outlets like your own show or uh, through blogs or Wikipedia articles. I think it's just important for this information to reach people. This might be a student doing research for his, his class project. This might be a teacher doing research for what he's going to teach his students. This might be politicians or their aides looking for information in order to shape policies. This might be journalists doing a background research or just the general public, people who have a nuclear power plant in their close proximity and want to find out what happened in Fukushima. All of these people would profit from an unbiased from a scientific approach to the UNSCARE report that is not dainted by industrial interests, the interests of a lobby group, a very powerful lobby group, annotated by, by doctors and scientists with the aim of actually getting a clearer picture of the health effects of ionizing radiation as a result of Fukushima fallout. That was Alex Rosen calling in from Berlin. He is a German pediatrician, Vice President of International Physicians for Prevention of Nuclear War in Germany, and former Vice Chair of the International IPPNW Board of Directors. The critical analysis of the UNSCIR report that he cited was created by the IPPNW and is available in English, German, and Japanese translations. All will be linked on the website, nuclearhotseat.com slash blog, under this episode, number 161. Believe it or not, Nuclear Hot Seat gets no outside funding and relies on your support to keep bringing you the anti-nuclear news every week. Donations are needed to cover bandwidth charges, which go up every time I have a popular podcast like two weeks ago with Steve Simmons of the USS Ronald Reagan. I also have to pay for website security, travel expenses to cover stories, web hosting, and much, much more. If you haven't yet donated or you have and would like to do so again, just go to NuclearHotSeat.com, the homepage, scroll down to the big red Donate button, click on it, and you will be secure with PayPal. Your assistance will go directly to helping me help you keep up to date on all things anti-nuclear. Activist shout-out to Indian anti-nuclear activist, our own nuclear Gandhi, Kumar Sundaram. This two-time interviewee of Nuclear Hot Seat We'll be speaking at the Tokyo Foreign Correspondence Club on Thursday, July 31st. His topic, the Japan-India Nuclear Agreement. Time to oppose and take the bilateral relations beyond corporate and military interests. Wish I could be a fly on the wall. So, Kumar, go knock some sense into them, would you please? Meanwhile, John Stewart, a reminder that I am your on-air nuclear pundit. And I am coming for you. I'll be showing up soon at a Comedy Central television studio near you. Here's today's final thought. How radiation is perceived is turning into the ultimate battlefield on the nuclear issue. The nuclear industry is taking aim at the conclusions of the Beer 7 report, which stands for the Biological Effects of Ionizing Radiation. It held the conclusion that there is no such thing as a safe dose of nuclear radiation, 
It is cumulative over our lifetime, and everything counts. This is the cornerstone of so many of our arguments about the dangers posed by the nuclear industry. Remove what is called the linear no-dose threshold argument, and the foundation for our conclusions will be quickly demolished under the relentless, well-funded pounding of the nuclear disinformation campaign. If they can convince the general population that radiation is no big deal and that everything nuke is clean, green, and sustainable, blah, 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 most people will be fooled, much to their long-term detriment. The nuclear industry has their disinformation infrastructure in place. The World Health Organization was compromised back in 1959 when it signed a censorship agreement with the International Atomic Energy Agency. As we heard in today's interview... The United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation, or UNSCARE, which, interestingly enough, is the anagram for UNSCARE, promotes the nuclear industry's party line by cherry-picking both its personnel and its data while putting a paternal, caring face to the world. Who believes these reports? Anyone who doesn't have the information to know better. And that's just about everyone. Worse, when they go to search for nuclear radiation online, our information shows up far down on search engines, definitely not on the first page. So most people will not find it, even if they know what to look for in the first place. The real ongoing danger is that the media, underfunded, overstressed, under deadline, or at times lazy, will do the exact same thing. Google nuclear radiation for a story, see the UNSCARE report, not see the IPPNW critical analysis of that report, and bam, put forward as gospel truth, the untruth. If the general population does not understand the delayed impact of radiation on health, if they believe the don't worry, be happy reports inundating them from the nuclear propagandists, if we lose the credibility of our talking points, there goes the neighborhood, meaning the planet and life and those of us who care about it. What to do? I think the anti-nuclear movement needs to go to work right now to attract world-class social media and search engine optimization experts to craft our online presence and get it out, out, out there. Pro bono would be best, but heck, if we pool our resources and have another bake sale, maybe we can hire somebody. The Internet is where this battle will be fought and won or lost, and we can't win without some kind of professional online help. We need to understand how to slick down our crushing mountains of information into easily digestible sound bites, get them out constantly and consistently on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and beyond, then build and use our databases to communicate the message and make everything we post go viral. Now, I say this to myself as much as to anyone else. Oh, goody, another set of skill sets to learn and implement. But I'm reaching out to learn them. And I suggest that any other activist group or individual do the same. We truly are David and Davida versus the nuclear Goliath. And while David won his battle, Malcolm Gladwell has not yet pointed out what we need to do to win this one. We've got to learn how to leverage our strengths to turn us into a strong enough force for good that we cannot be shouted down or counted out. We need to build our own info infrastructure and then use it. So, um, how do you post individual messages on Twitter using an iPhone? Anyone? This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, July 22nd, 2014. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, our friend Iori Muchizuki and his fabulous blog, Fukushima Diary, which gave us the basis for three different stories today, Japan Times, the Albuquerque Journal, and an excellent story by Lauren Villagran, St. Louis Today, Reuters, WYFF-TV, the Miami Herald, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the ever-vigilant Nuclear Hot Seat Facebook community. Theme music written by me, sung by Marilee Weaver. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY-TV, and we can also be found on airprogressive.com. Our archive is available on iTunes. You can subscribe under podcasts, or you can find us on our newly searchable website, nuclearhotseat.com. 
Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. Please do not send me a message on Facebook. It's hard for me to keep track of them, and I will lose your information. Use the email. Thank you. We are copyright 2014, Libby Halevi and Harvestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed. You have my permission to reuse this material as long as proper attribution is given, meaning my name, the name of the program, and the website.